Hello and welcome to our Housing Association update event. I'm Hugh Swainson. I'm a partner within Buzzacott's charity and not-for-profit team. Uh, just before we get started, a few virtual housekeeping points. Uh, as a webinar, uh, your cameras for all attendees and microphones will be uh, automatically turned off. And, uh, but you will be able to communicate uh, with us via the Q&A chat function on the right hand side uh, of your screen. So please do ask any questions uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, those will all be treated uh, anonymously. Um, if we have time at the end of the session, we'll cover those questions. But any we don't get round to, we will cover off uh, via an email after the uh, event. Uh, the webinar is being recorded today, uh, so a copy of the recording as well as the slides will be shared with you via email after the event. So now let's look at uh, today's agenda. So this is very much an update event. It's looking at the key things that you need to think about uh, for 2023 uh, and we're splitting it between the year-end preparation which uh, I'll look at and the financial reporting uh, update uh, the new auditing standards that we've got for this year, which Matt, who's an associate director within our uh, charity not-for-profit audit team, uh, will look at. Then we're going to turn to VAT updates uh, from CAM and finally other taxes uh, from Luke. Um, so let's get started looking at uh, the year-end uh, financial reporting for 2022-23. So the good news uh, this year essentially is that there are no significant changes on the financial reporting side for 2022-23. So really the accounts that you're preparing uh, at the year end will look uh, very similar to last year from that respect. So uh, the financial reporting standard FRS 102 has not changed uh, and neither the housing SORP or the accounting direction, uh, they're both the same as they were last year. And similarly other financial reporting requirements, so if you've got subsidiaries under the Companies Act or maybe under uh, Section 1A of FRS 102, uh, there's no key changes there either. There are changes that we're going to see uh, in the future. So there's FRED 82, the Financial Reporting Exposure Draft for future changes. And this is all about aligning FRS uh, 102 with some of the uh, changes in international financial reporting standards. So these include things like financial instruments, there's change around income recognition, uh, revenue recognition, proposed and lease accounting in particular. I think one people are most uh, interested in is the IFRS 16 on lease accounting and the alignment with that which really brings operating leases uh, onto the balance sheet. But this isn't uh, all happening for a while. The uh, the FRED 82 is proposing a transition date of 1st of January 2025 which means this won't impact until your 31st of March 2026 year ends. Um, however it will impact sooner than you think because if you're changing comparative the opening balances to those comparatives will be from the 1st of April uh, 2024. So it will come around quickly, but because today we're focusing on 2023 and changes to 2023, uh, really we're looking at the same financial reporting framework uh, for this year. So the changes uh, are really coming from what's changing in the operating uh, environment, which I'll look at in a second, uh, and what's changing in uh, the international standards and auditing, which is a few key changes there for this year, which Matt is going to look at. So let's look at the operating environment on the next slide. This is quite neatly summarised within the set risk profile uh, issued by the regulator in October 2022 um, and a lot of these points people will be uh, familiar with but let's summarise what some of those key uh, factors in the operating environment that will impact this year's accounts and audit might be. Inflation of, of course is going to dominate so this is both inflationary impact on income so looking at the 7% uh, rent cap coming in from 1st of April 2023, uh, the risk on arrears so potentially increased bad debt property sales are they going to realise the same amount uh, going forward and the inflationary impact on costs we're looking at the, uh, the challenges on staff recruitment and retention and the increased staffing costs energy costs supply chain costs and the, uh, the related sort of uh, counterparty risk uh, on some of those uh, supply chains uh, as well so all of this we're seeing a financial squeeze ultimately and uh, challenges in balancing those budgets uh, for the coming year and uh, years. Borrowing is a key factor in the equation, uh, potentially the cost of new borrowing going up, but also on existing borrowing. The majority of debt in the sector is a fixed rate, but there is a significant minority of variable rate loans out there, which obviously the cost of those will be going up 
uh, with uh, interest rates. And uh, the other really key factor is the headroom on any loan uh, covenants going forward and is the financial squeeze going to mean that there's less headroom going forward on those uh, loan uh, covenants. So that's a risk. Regulation continues to increase and um, highlighted here is some of it, you know, the existing uh, regulation that the sector is still wrestling with around sort of data protection, but also new standards and upcoming standards, which is all increasing the regulatory uh, environment um, and the compliance risk uh, for the sector. And there's links here to some other risks as well. So if you've got risks around staff recruitment and retention, this could uh, impact your uh, ability to ensure the same same standards of compliance if your teams are, are stretched as well and your finances are stretched. Um, also stock qualities are going to be a key risk looking forward, um, looking at again that financial squeeze and the ability to uh, invest the same levels in repairs, retrofitting, carbon neutrality, all the rest of it. So what does this mean for audits? So just going over to my next slide, uh, and uh, the order impact. I think the key message here is that a lot of these things in the uh, operating environment this year, um, they impact a lot of the sort of judgments and assumptions that are involved in preparing a set of financial uh, statements. And this is a really key uh, area for audit. So um, you'll probably be aware that the uh, auditing standards ISO 540 and 570 were significantly enhanced in recent years, uh, looking at uh, accounting judgments and estimates and also going uh, concern. So all of these changes really mean that it's extra important this year that um, you evidence your assessment of areas of judgment and estimate, as well as giving that supporting information uh, for audit in these areas. But let's look at a, a few specifics in here. And I think the first and most important one is probably going concern. So this is the financial viability of um, the organisation. Uh, ultimately, any set of financial statements is uh, prepared um, and with the going concern basis being a key underlying assumption. And it's the board's responsibility to consider a period of not less than one year from approving the financial statements uh, as to whether you're financially viable. It's the auditor's assessment to requirement to review that assessment at going concern and challenge it and consider if it's uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, any going concern assessment's got to be proportional. So obviously, if you're in the lucky situation of not having uh, uh, any or much external debt and uh, being you know, high liquidity, uh, the going concern assessment may need to not go into as quite as much detail uh, around sensitivity analysis and risks, etc. Uh, it needs to be proportional to the situation. But for most associations, there will be uh, quite a bit of external debt and quite a bit of uh, change in risk going on uh, with the current operating environment. So this going concern assessments are uh, really crucial. So what kind of things are we looking at? What makes a good going concern uh, assessment? Well, it's really making sure that your uh, assessment and assumptions are, are, are well documented and it's clear for the auditor so that they, uh, we have something to, to audit in this area in terms of the judgments that you've made uh, and the supporting calculations that, that you, you produced. So is looking at updating your financial projections, obviously, for all of those changes around inflation that, that we've talked about and documenting those assumptions that you've used around inflation, uh, around what kind of income realisation you're uh, you're going to get. Um, loan covenants, of, again, is going to be key uh, in all of this. So projecting what the headroom is going to be um, on those loan covenants and how, you know, areas where that might get uh, tight in, in the future. Um, and then looking at the sort of risks and uncertainties that exist in your financial projections. So what things might go against you? What uncertainties are there um, that could produce a, a risk that may, you know, drop that headroom in the uh, uh, in the loan covenants and cause an issue or other, you know, cash flow issues uh, going forward? And trying to quantify those uh, those those risks. So it may be that if you've got a number of significant risks based on the assumptions that you're producing, that you, you need to give a bit of sense sensitivity analysis in your projections, what would happen if this uh, went up or down by a few percent? What impact would that have on the going concern uh, ass assessment? And with any of these things, if things do go against you, you'll put mitigations in place. So mitigations are often things like cutting costs or delaying costs um, in response to uh, those sensitivity analysis risks. So it's about sort of documenting and quantifying those within uh, the going concern assessment. 
ultimately this now is because of these um, the environment and these uh, enhanced auditing standards is a really important area for the audit so it's an area the auditor will want to look at during um, the audit uh, process so not leaving it to the end of the process looking at during the audit field work um, and it's definitely worth discussing in advance what you're planning on preparing in terms of a going concern assessment and agreeing with that with the auditor before the audit other key areas um rent to ears obviously there's a risk that that will uh, increase and therefore that can impact both the projections that we've just talked about or the estimates of bad debts uh, in the accounts impairments going to be a key area of estimates so this could be anything from you know existing stock if there's a sort of uh, uh, under investment in uh, repairs or retrofitting etc there could be impairments to existing stock could be uh, um, valuation of investment properties it could even be on new bills if your costs are going up and uh, potentially uh, the amount you realise on new uh, bills is uh, changing that could result in impairments uh, so that needs to be looked at uh, as well. On the compliance side uh, as we've seen there's so many uh, regulations and compliance risks at the moment that are uh, they're increasing the risk in this area for audit it's something we look at sort of slightly indirectly so what we're really looking out for is we call showstoppers things that will if you have a compliance breach it's going to uh, cause a problem either from a regulatory point of view um, or from a going concern reputational point of view could really impact the income but um, auditors increasingly want to see that evidence that you're taking account of these new compliance compliance uh, requirements and seeing the evidence of those uh, oversight in those areas as part of the audit. And finally, just to talk about fraud risk, I think this is potentially increasing at the moment, whether that's from just the cost of living and the increased incentive for fraud, or, or whether that's from sort of the cyber environment as well and the, the increased uh, attempts on frauds on organisation that we're seeing at the moment. Um, so there is a new auditing standard, ISA 240 on fraud this year, which is increasing the focus in this area as well. So certainly areas such as the, the cyber side, looking at the sort of training that you've got in place within the organisation, the multi-factor authentication, how you deal with changing bank details, all of those areas are increasingly important uh, for the order. So just to conclude on it, this area, really it's all about the sort of preparation for the audit making sure it's clear um, uh, and documented those key assumptions that you've made uh, in all of these uh, areas and that's sort of ready for the auditor to to scrutinize and challenge uh, during uh, the audit but now to look at some of those uh, auditing standards that are new for this year I'm going to hand over to Matt Great. Um, so in this section, really just looking to provide an update on a couple of those key changes in auditing standards that are going to impact audits for the first time this year. So there's two standards really to update on that are really key. So the first one is ISA 240, which you just mentioned, which is around the auditor's responsibilities relating to fraud. And the second of the uh, new standards or the revised standards is ISA 315, which is around identifying and assessing the risk of material misstatement within the audit, so essentially the, the risk assessment phase. Um, so uh, just briefly why changes are made to auditing standards. So it's generally due to that continued drive to increase audit quality in the sector, but it can also be due to changes in the underlying operating environment. So while it's useful to know about these changes from an external comp uh, audit compliance side of things, uh, it's also useful from a sort of broader risk assessment and assurance framework perspective as well, because there's often changes that impact that as well. Um, so this slide firstly covers ISA 214, which is the um, <coughs> fraud side of things. So this is clarifications really around the auditor's responsibilities in ensuring that the financial statements are free from material misstatement due to fraud and that enhanced focus as well on professional scepticism. Um, so one reasonably interesting area of this is the increased emphasis on the fact that transactions with related parties might carry a greater risk of resulting in material fraud. So it's a, a good reminder, um, this update to the standard uh, for procedures in this area in terms of those that you have for identifying related party transactions and communicating who the related parties are to individuals in the finance team as well so that they can be keeping an eye out from their perspective of any potential related party transactions so that those transactions entered, entered into can really be fully evidenced as following the full procedure in ensuring that objectivity and value for money as part of the procurement framework on that side of things. 
This revision also clarifies the requirement for discussion between auditors and client staff to determine any instances of alleged fraud in the year. Um, so this includes direct communication where appropriate with individuals who are assigned by your organisation as being responsible uh, for ensuring that any allegations of fraud are fully investigated. So really around ensuring the completeness there of information with respect to any fraud allegations um, and that being provided to external auditors as well. So in terms of actions on this side, it's really a case of ensuring that your policies are up to date in this area and that they're appropriate in respect of the size of your organisation as well. Um, where relevant have staff members, for example, um, had induction in this area? Are they aware of your policy and would they know who to report any allegations of fraud to? Um, included on this slide as well as a useful link uh, just to some government guidance around whistleblowing, which is a useful starting point for ensuring that your policies are consistent with that best practice as well. Uh, from an audit impact, what might be seen from an external audit side of things. Um, so audit testing might focus on different areas of the transaction cycles that are more susceptible to fraud um, and it might include elements more focused on the controls designed to prevent fraud. So, for example, the controls around setting up or amending standing information for payment details uh, and we might also see if there's been specific fraud in the year. Depending on the scale and complexity of the fraud, uh, your external auditor might be required to involve ex experts as part of their audit to ensure that the risk of misstatement in areas have been effectively concluded. Just moving on now to the next slide and the next revised auditing standard, so ISA 315, which is around identifying and assessing the risk as part of the audit. So this change really ensures that the way that audits are planned and executed remains appropriate for modern organisations and that audits effectively capture the areas of key risk. Um, so in particular, taking into consideration that probably over the last 10 years or so, we've seen increased use of automation within financial processing, and that's likely a trend that we'll see continue in the future. Uh, so really cementing at this stage, uh, the existing good practice around auditing in those areas within the auditing standards themselves. Uh, within these amendments, there's an emphasis on proportionality. So this means that uh, changes will have a larger impact on organisations with complex transaction flows and high levels of automation and not as much of a significant impact on smaller organisations. So there is that element of proportionality within the standard as well. So it's not a one size fits all type standard. Uh, the key changes from the audit perspective really are outlined on this side, slide. So there's the inherent risk being broken down into additional factors, uh, the broader spectrum of risk, um, the separate consideration of inherent risk and control risk, a focus on audit evidence being obtained to be proportional to the risk assessment, more work being required on the design and implementation of controls that are relevant to the audit, and a significant increase uh, in particular in references to IT and in particular to IT control. So it's really these final two bullet points which I'm going to focus on because they're probably the most relevant for you as uh, organization. So moving to the next slide, the first element just to look at is the design and implementation of controls. Um, so auditors really being required here to assess the controls that are in place at more detail throughout the audit process, but in particular at the planning uh, stage. So what you're likely to see would be increased interaction with on-site teams as part of the planning assessment and more questions around controls. Um, if you've got an interim audit, your auditor might also uh, want to look at this area as part of their interim work. And it also states that for highly automated transactions, auditors can't rely only on sample testing and they should be reviewing the underlying control operation in much more depth. Um, so, for example, if you've got automation involved in the posting of rental receipts against tenant accounts, they'd be looking to look, test much more the control from a point of data input to determine the reliability of that control rather than relying on purely sort of substantive or sample based testing. We're also likely to see uh, continued increased emphasis from auditors on the review of reconciliations, verifications, etc. And an assurance also being placed on larger data sets and making more use of data analytics as part of an audit approach. But generally an audit approach which continues to add value to your organisation in that it's targeted at where the risks are becoming apparent within organisations. Uh, it's really saying here that the gross risk in these areas that are covered by automated controls is typically increasing due to that higher volume or value of transactions being processed in that way and that the assurance over the controls in those areas should therefore be higher to ensure that that net risk within your organization remains within your risk tolerance. Uh, 
Um, so it's also something that potentially requires consideration uh, from a sort of internal audit perspective or in risk management perspective to ensure that you're happy that the risks in those areas are being mitigated effectively. Uh, the external auditor will still need to perform their own tests, but any work of internal audit can potentially help inform their risk assessment in those areas as well. Just moving to the next slide, so really the final broad area being uh, the reliance on IT control. So ensuring that the IT governance within your organization is proportional to the complexity of uh, operations which pass through those IT systems. Um, so considering how you're assessing and understanding IT systems, and identifying areas of potential highest risk in the associated IT control. So these typically fall into three broader areas. So the first being access management, uh, then change management or version control, finally IT operations so we've just got a slide each of each of these areas just to provide examples of what they might be so onto the first slide coming up is around access management so this is really the risk that users would be able to perform actions which they shouldn't have authority to do so due to a gap in the IT control so an example here would be when someone leaves your organization or transfers teams you'd anticipate their right IT access is removed or modified in line with an agreed timetable so typically expecting a policy to be in place that forms part of that time frame in which users would be removed so you may see auditors asked to look to check levers from the organization against the windows accounts to confirm that their removal took place in line with that policy so just an example there from an access management perspective what an auditor would look at uh, the next slide shows more around change management so this is the risk around changes being made to underlying data without authorization. So giving a bit more of a non-financial example here. So it may be that the data repairs ticket is issued, uh, is used to monitor targets um, against repair time for tenant satisfaction, for example. So there theoretically is a risk there that individuals involved in the process could manually change that date to a later date so that repairs were shown as completed within a target time when in reality they weren't. So from an audit perspective, there may want to be a review of the access and permissions to determine who can change that underlying data and also to check whether there's any log made of changes that are manually made to that data um, outside of the normal transaction cycle. Um, so again, just feeding into that broader organizational consideration around the robustness of data from that perspective. Um, on to the next slide, so just one final example is around that of IT operations. So this is more your broader operations. So in terms of data backups and ensuring that the data is being backed up with a frequency that you'd expect as well. So uh, from an audit perspective, checking that that established schedule um, or the frequency of backups has been followed and that there's evidence there of those backup files. Obviously, a lot of data can have really significant implications from both an audit perspective and also an operational perspective. So this is one of those key controls that your auditor is likely to want to make sure has been operating during the period as well and maybe slightly broader than you might have experienced in the past. So just coming on to a final slide here, uh, just to summarize really um, how to prepare and the benefits um, of that preparation for your organization. So from a preparation perspective, it's a case of ensuring that those controls and processes have been formally documented and are up to date. So particularly in light of any changes to control uh, which might have been implemented uh, as more information begins to be held electronically, particularly thinking over the last few years here. Uh, and do you understand how you can evidence those data flows within your organization, the different steps involved and the transfer of data between different applications within your organization as well? Uh, you'll want to discuss really with your auditor their plans around this and the additional work that they anticipate being required, uh, along with any impact on the audit timetable. So considering whether, for example, you might need to involve IT teams earlier in the audit process within those planning discussions to make sure that the auditor can be accurately informed as to the processes and procedures that are in place from that perspective. And really from a sort of benefits preparation, the key benefits really are being understanding your own information flows and ensuring that your risk assessment around those flows is accurate and that the assurance framework work effectively manages those risks in that area. Uh, it also leads secondly to an efficient audit process. So having those controls documented can reduce the time required from your staff members within that audit interaction in building up that knowledge of the controls with the auditors. It also allows for audit tests to be planned that can help reduce any duplication of efforts within the process. Uh, 
Um, there's also a, typically a reduction in audit costs as a quote here, which shows really that organizations with higher levels of automa automation typically pay proportionally lower audit fees. And um, it's not necessary that those audits are any less complex, but it's really that in order to get to that point, when you can automate a process, you've usually got a very good knowledge of how it works. You know where your data is flowing and that you'd be able to prepare a good audit trail for an auditor, which therefore allows for an efficient audit to take place. So they're really the key sort of takeaways from those changes in auditing standards and how they'll affect you. Uh, so just going to pass over now to Cam to provide an update from a, that perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to cover the key considerations from a VAT perspective because VAT is obviously um, quite a significant factor when considering the costs involved um, for organisations in the sector. And um, if I start off with the main area where VAT sort of has the biggest impact, and that is when you're having, when you're receiving construction services and um, the VAT liability of those services. It's important to remember where you can obtain VAT relief because obviously if we can avoid having to incur VAT in the first place, then that um, obviously means that you're incurring less VAT uh, uh, rather than sort of having to worry about how, how much you can reclaim. So I'm going to run through the main areas where you can get VAT relief. Um, the first is obviously for the construction of new build residential accommodation that um, the construction services for any new build residential accommodation will be zero rated. And the new build uh, commercial uh, construction services will always always be standard rated. They will often have a mix of both because uh, typically you, when you are building uh, a new estate or a, uh, a new housing complex that you will have some elements of commercial shops and and buildings as part of the any new project and that might be partly because of uh, social aspects in terms of the, the people on the estates or even may even be for commercial benefit in that you might want to construct some <coughs> commercial purely for just uh, commercial elements. So when you have a mixture of those two uh, construction services between new build residential and new build commercial, you will have some form of apportionment depending on how much uh, of the site is obviously residential and how much is commercial. The next area where you, you often get uh, VAT complications and, and obviously some VAT relief is, is where you're buying an existing building or an existing commercial, you have existing commercial buildings and what you're doing is converting those commercial buildings to residential buildings. So there is VAT relief available for those services of carrying out the conversion, but it's important to note that that obviously only um, relates to the actual conversion works themselves. So if you have any associated works around some of those sort of maybe, let's say, for example, landscaping or areas around those buildings, those kind of works wouldn't qualify. It's only the actual works of converting those buildings to residential that would qualify um, for the zero rated relief. So one of the more sort of slightly complicated reliefs relates to a changed number of dwellings. So that is when you convert an existing property into additional flats or additional number of units. So the VAT legislation actually just talks about a change of number. So technically speaking, you could move from three flats to two flats and still obtain the relief, but it's designed for when you're increasing the number of units. So if you have um, a house and you convert it to five flats or, or four flats or something like that, then that would be a situation where the construction services that are involved in that conversion would qualify for the reduced rate of VAT, which is at 
again, um, you know, if you have different types of activities on one estate or one development, then you may have more than one relief available. So it just depends on on how you apportion those works between all the different elements. Now, obviously you work closely with with the constructor or the builder on, on all of those things, but um, it, in some cases you may need some assistance in trying to decide how much qualifies for which relief and um, what elements can be considered to be the actual conversion works rather than just um, some repairs or maintenance or other works that wouldn't qualify. And that's in terms of the last point, obviously um, organisations will be required to update their housing stock on a regular basis and carry out works to existing properties. So it's important to remember that refurbishments will always attract VAT at the standard rate. So if you're carrying out any kind of refurbishment or repair works, they will always, always be standard rated. There may be some cases where, whereby if you're carrying out repair works or refurbishment works, you would charge your existing tenants or even perhaps non-tenants if it's for communal works whereby uh, the work extends to um, tenants and non-tenants properties. Now, in those kind of situations, it, although you'll be incurring VAT at the standard rate, you may have to charge for those re refurbishments and that would obviously be a taxable supply. So we'll come on to um, a bit later on about uh, the VAT recovery of costs. So it's just important to note that where you have some costs that relate to taxable supplies, obviously it's good to try and apportion them and or highlight them so you can ensure that you have the optimum VAT recovery of those costs as well. Similarly, um, another area where you're always going to incur standard rated uh, costs is in relation to your design, professional cost architects fees, all of that kind of professional services in relation to any new constructions or developments. They will always be standard rated. Now, that always causes a problem because even if you're doing new build residential work, which would be zero rated, you will incur VAT on the professional fees of the design and um, and any other sort of related fees, estate agent fees or thing, things that are related to the new build, which would incur VAT. So in my next slide, I'm going to cover the typical way that people try and mitigate having to incur those standard rated fees because obviously um, it is possible to to reduce the amount of standard rated professional fees you get by using a design and build structure and effectively that also gives you control over the apportionment of the different um, rates of VAT for different works. If we think about Effectively, uh, the design and build structure is when you create your own subsidiary or related party that will effectively carry out the construction and the design services and supply them to your organisation. They will buy in all the construction services and um, professional fees and although those fees that they incur would be vatable, when they supply a single supply of the design and build to the to your organization, they are able to effectively apply the same VAT treatment as the construction to the design. So effectively you're wrapping up all of your professional fees into a construction service and therefore if you have a new build residential, it enables the organisation to effectively not incur that VAT it can't reclaim and the subsidiary that has 
incurred the professional fees in its service is able to reclaim the VAT because it has provided a, a zero rated service to your organisation. There are a number of things to, to kind of make sure that it works in practice because in, in theory it, it's a great idea, but in practice it often falls down because people don't implement those structures properly. So I'm just going to run through some of the, the important points to note and to make sure that you have in place uh, to try and avoid any issues to, to that, that treatment. So some of this may seem sort of, you know, relatively uh, straightforward, but it, it's often missed. So there has to be uh, contractual terms between your organisation and the subsidiary or the design and build, build company. It has to have the ability to actually create a supply or to make a supply. Obviously, if you have a subsidiary and it doesn't have any staff or doesn't have any any actual um, ability to make any supplies, then HMRC could look at that and say, well, uh, how can you have a design and build company without any actual staff or any ability to deliver any services? So it's always um, important that they have staff or, or contractors or something to enable the subsidiary to, to, to be able to make a supply. There should always be a markup or a profit margin to ensure that the design and build company has its own business or is, it has a business activity. And in terms of the contractual position, obviously the organisation still has a say in what the design and uh, will be and and how it's how it's put together, but the contractors, sorry, the the architects and the professional services providers should also should enter into agreements with the design and build company because that that is who is deemed to be providing the design services and deciding the design for the organisation to approve. So, in order for that to to, to work in practice, the organisation cannot directly contract with, with those providers of those services. Similarly, the invoices for those from those professional services providers should all be issued to the design and build company. Again, that sounds like common sense, but, but you'll be amazed at how many times that doesn't happen and invoices are just paid and um, that is is not, you know, is effectively challenged by HMRC because the invoice is not addressed to the design and build company. Um, and, and the last thing to note on the design and build structure is that it also enables you to control how much of the works are apportioned to different areas. Obviously that has a big bearing in terms of how much VAT is incurred in the first place and how much work um, is carried out at the standard rate because obviously it enables a design, sorry, the design and build structure enables a single VAT rate for new for um, the works being carried out. But if that site or that work being carried out is partly standard rated, it also means that the design and build company would have to charge VAT at the standard rate to the organisation as well. But it gives some leeway to, to make that decision as to how much is apportioned to be standard rated um, away from the original builders and puts you in a better position to control that apportionment and the method of apportionment to obviously enable the benefit to split it between standard rated and zero rated. OK, uh, if we move on to the next slide. Um, and that's just some important points to note in relation to commercial property. 
um, it, if you have commercial properties and it's important to note that the rent would start off being exempt unless you opt to tax the building. An option to tax only applies to commercial properties, doesn't apply to residential properties. But the importance of the option to tax is that it demonstrates an um, intention to make taxable supplies from the commercial property. So therefore, if you opt to tax at the correct time, you are able to ensure that you can reclaim any VAT on the costs of either um, preparing that property for rental or the construction of that property or uh, any refurbishment costs. An important thing to note in respect of the option to tax, um, there have been some changes in HMRC's policy from the 1st of February this year, which mean that effectively they are no longer issuing acknowledgement letters. So if you make an option to tax, you will only get a response by email to say that your email has been received. Uh, and in some cases, we've heard that that those emails are not even being received. So it's it, at the moment we're in a bit of a state of limbo as to, to exactly how all of this will work in practice. But the important thing to note is that when you make your option to tax, it, it has to be um, correctly notified at the outset because if you don't, there, there are no, no easy ways to rectify it going forwards because the system at HMRC is, is currently a bit of a mess and it may never get resolved if you don't have some proof that you've made the correct options tax in the first place. And just covering off the VAT recovery on my next slide. So obviously VAT recovery is another important area for, for most organisations because there is a very low recovery overall, so it's important to get uh, as much of the VAT back as you can. The first thing to note is, is direct attribution of costs. So again, typically if we go back to the example I, I gave earlier in, in when you're perhaps refurbishing or repairing existing housing stock, if you're required to, to um, repair a roof, for example, which covers non-tenanted buildings. Some of those costs may relate to to non non-tenants, and you recharge for those with the addition of VAT. Let's say that was a separate cost, and you you incurred VAT on those costs. You would be able to directly attribute that cost to the taxable supply of recharging it to a non-tenant. And if that, as long as that cost was was invoiced for separately when you incurred the cost, then that is a direct cost that relates to the standard rated supply of repairing that roof for a non-tenant, and you could reclaim that VAT at 100%. The other VAT that related to tenants, and assuming you don't charge your tenants for the for that works, then that would fall as a direct direct attribution to their social renting. So that would be a zero percent recoverable. So direct attribution is obviously a requirement of partial exemption, but it, it is key to have those, have that in the back of your mind to make sure that you can input the costs in the correct way at the start and identify them. And overhead costs and any kind of residual costs are subject to partial exemption that there is standard method based on turnover, but um, there are various other methods you can use with the permission of HMRC and how, um, you know, it's typical to have a, a special method agree and many associations have got a framework agreement uh, uh, or agree special methods or sectors on new developments as and when required. So again, uh, another thing which is, is worth noting is that there is long delay and, and quite a lot of hoops to jump through to get any new agreements with HMRC for partial exemption, special partial exemption methods. 
So if you have an existing special pot, a partial exemption method, and it's producing good results for you or, or, or is reasonably good, then it's probably not worth trying to change it in, in the short term at the moment because it's taking at least nine nine months to to get a, a new agreement through. Lastly, uh, if if your association is involved in any non business activity, uh, just to a, a final note to remember to carry out a separate apportionment before you carry out your partial exemption exemption um, calculations. So I think that's my last slide. And I'll hand over to Luke. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, so I, I cover all the other taxes that aren't covered by VAT and uh, my colleague uh, Cam went uh, through uh, just before me. Um, there have been quite a lot of changes in tax or let's say a lot of announcements um, where we had the sort of uh, pre budget, the mini statement and then reversal of that last year and the autumn statement and actually we've got another budget coming up in three weeks time which may change other taxes. Now a lot of those changes um, the, the sectors and the housing association sector um, may not be impacted by because of a lot of the exemptions that are available. Now one of the areas you know that we I'll talk about the exemption in a moment but one of, one of the things to bear in mind is that although there are exemptions there are conditions and um, it will depend on the different structure of your housing association as well, which I'll talk about. Um, but the main corporation tax rate is going up from 19% to 25% from April. So a lot of people will say, well, that, that's, you know, that's a bit of, a little bit of an increase or 31.5% increase. In fact, is actually if there is any tax leakage that this is going to be a little bit more costly to you as a sector. Um, so even more important to make sure your tax affairs are as, um, as tightly uh, structured as possible to ensure there is as minimal um, tax leakage as, as possible. Um, and it's not always possible um, as we'll see in a moment. So if I turn to my, my first slide, um, just a reminder of the main direct tax exemptions. Again, this will this will depend on what type of structure you have as a housing association. I know they can be quite complex and involve quite a lot of entities, and there can be different types of entities from uh, charities, which are you know, often companies limited by guarantee or new CIOs, um, to co co cooperatives as the, as the main body for a lot of housing associations, and some of them, you know, will be large groups that involve. Uh, uh, multitude of these including things like LLPs, the design and the build a build a subsidiary company that, that Cam talked about, which is quite common in the sector um, and, and enabling the, the, you know, a lot of the VAT saving, savings as well as uh, removing some of those commercial risks and separate development companies. And there could be other commercial or other types of, of, of entities within your structure. So your tax bases and your exemptions will depend on what type of structure that you have. So when I talk now, I'm going to be talking broadly and, and focusing on, on, on the two main types of entities that we have. And then I'll talk about the th a third one, which is be the design and build subsidiary. So it's important to look at what tax reliefs are available because that's where the leakage has happened if we don't fall within those reliefs. Um, so the main one for um, housing associations which are um, set up as as cooperatives or as uh, now calling it the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act um, entities um, that there are exemptions and the, the main one is rents received from your, your members your tenants are disregarded for corporation tax purposes um, which which is where a bulk of you know the income traditionally will come from. So that that's that's fine. So we've got a, a big exemption there. But what about other types of rental income? Um, you know, I think I've got a warning there is that if you've got other commercial type of rental income within this structure or within this type of entity, that they may not be covered and that may be subject to corporation tax. Again, there could be some planning, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment with subsidiaries. But do watch that, do watch the different types. And, and as we know, with funds getting tighter, that just like in any other sort of not-for-profit body, we are getting a bit more commercial and our ideas are out there to try and generate further income, especially with the good knowledge and resource and property knowledge that you have. So again, just be aware of, the, of, of, of actually that that type of income may not be exempt. 
The other thing on as a cooperative, um, the exemption is on from corporation tax on any chargeable games when you're disposing of property, which has been or is still currently occupied by a tenant of the association. Disposing of that um, is exempt um, and not a chargeable gain under that current structure. Um, the other thing just at the, that um, to note as well, if it's the interest payable by association, that's disregarded. Um, so nothing you can do there. And then other types of income, particularly other types of investment income, are still taxable. And things like um, bank deposit interest will be taxable if received by the the co-op housing association. So let's look. I'll go on to the next slide to look at a slight um, comparative to that with. A charity. So you may have a housing association with a charity or subsidiary, which is a, a charity or affiliated charity, as often is referred to. Well, there are more generous exemptions. Um, we talked about interest, and well, actually, if you get interest in, in a cha the charity entity, then um, if it's bank deposit or any other forms of interest, then that will be exempt. Um, so, an, an important uh, differentiation there. Rent income, rent generally is exempt as long as it's pure rent so it doesn't matter whether it's for your tenants or not or to say your 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 members i should say um that will be exempt do watch with rent though that um within the charity particularly is that um actually for providing a lot of other services as housing associations do that it may not be what we call schedule a business rent for tax and pure rent and fall within that exact um exemption so if it's more like you know even if you're going further than that and hiring out facilities for instance that a lot of people in the sector think oh we'll hire out of our facilities generally then that will be exempt times the rent no that's trading um now if that relates to your objects as a charity and it relates to you as a housing association what you do as your main charitable object if you're a charity then that's what we call primary purpose uh, trading income and that is exempt as well if it's following your primary purpose as a charity under that body so that's important to know and we'll touch a little bit more on that if we have time um capital gains doesn't matter if if you're selling the property where you've got a you know that um has been let out to one of your tenants uh, one of your members or or actually has been um let out to anybody else any type of property or asset within a charity structure then the capital gain is exempt the big proviso there and for all of the exemptions is that the the gain or the income must be applied for charitable purposes, which is pretty broad in most and, and in every case it should really be, even if it's towards your administration costs. The one area that we, we've seen and we've been hearing about a little bit over the last few years and, and, and lately that we've seen um, where there's been tax leakage that's worth looking at is feeding tariffs. So a lot of housing associations if they got in there early with solar paneling etc getting feed-in tariffs and quite generous um, you know rates um, then that income is unhelpfully i think it's confirmed with hmrc that that will be miscellaneous income which isn't covered by the above or other exemptions so that generally is, is taxable if it's a substantial amount um, however what we've seen that um, some housing associations are missing is, is getting actually deductions against that income such as for your interest that I mentioned earlier is that if, if you have got interest then that can be deducted from that or interest payments as I say and actually that can often negate any tax charge at all so you can also go back so if you've been paying tax on your feeding tariffs over the last few years it may be worth going back to see if you can try and get that relief and we've worked with um, some organizations to to do that um, the other thing that was was announced uh, last year that um, came out and it was a concern for the sector was the new residential property development tax RDPT and although it was initially announced that there would be an exemption for charities and other not-for-profit uh, organizations such as registered housing associations it wasn't it wasn't mentioned as to whether that would go further because of all the subsidiaries we've got it's now been mentioned that it will cover wholly owned subsidiaries of those non-profits as well which is good news so that uh, type of tax will, will not affect most of you um, if I move on to the next slide. Area where I just want to cover and I mentioned is, is property transactions and we talked about trading. 
Now, this is where there can be quite a lot of a tax leakage um, and an area that uh, many of you may be more than well familiar with because that's a lot of your work is involved with property, property development um, and refurbishments, etc. As, as can touched on the VAT side and it also involves buying and selling in, uh, property as well, which can lead to a gain. Now, as we mentioned, if it's a if it's a chargeable gain and it's through a charitable body, then it's exempt or if it's through a co-op and it's the old tenant property, then that part of it will be exempt as well. So that's fine if we have a gain, but there can be a fine line between what is a capital gain when you're dealing in property and what can be trading. Are you getting involved with the development trade? If you're simply buying and selling something or buy you and you've you bought something that you've held or onto as an investment or for your charitable purpose or your housing association purpose for a long time and you sell, without doing anything, then that's a gain. If you develop that property, that could be trading. And it would only just be things that you've held and you're developing and selling on. It could be something that you're buying and where you're entering into a joint venture structure, let's say a developer, to have some of that property used for your own mission um, and housing association purposes. Or And it could also have a mix of, as with it, we can actually sell part of that, maybe it's commercial, shops, or further other development that um, could be sold and could be in a sort of a joint venture or partnership with a developer. Now, we see lots of structures with that involving things like LLP structures where you can helpfully have a look through for tax and structure and plan your side of that. But there can be some unexpected tax costs and there can be things that can arise with working through a developer, depending on how you structure, not just the entity that you're using, but the agreements as well. So big care there. Again, I would always say seek professional tax advice in entering to any sorts of agreements of any sort with the developer. So one thing that Cam talked about was the design and build train subsidiary. So often the, the entity that's used to carry out and build property for your own purpose. Now, we can reduce corporation tax to nil with any subsidiary that's that's under a charity or within a charity structure by making a qualifying charitable donation, often called corporate gift aid, up to the, the charity entity or a charity entity um, of what would otherwise be your corporation tax profits. Now, put potentially there because there are some restrictions not everyone is necessarily um, that familiar with is that to be able to do that, you need to have distributable reserves because although it's treated as a donation for tax purposes under company law, if you are paying to a parent entity, be it a charity, then that is a distribution under company law, although treated as a donation for tax. So you need to have distributable reserves. Now, distributable reserves is, is, will be, is, is, is under accounting concepts. Now we know for corporation tax, we have adjustments such as things like capital allowances versus depreciation, what we have for accounting, which don't always match. We also have things like group relief and, and watch that. Within a group, you may be, especially since COVID, you may be actually surrendering losses to your various entities. Now that can mismatch some of the reserves in the different entities and therefore give some sort of a, uh, under coverage, if you like, on on those reserves for future gift day payments. If you're not paying across or paying for those losses that are being surrendered between two entities, so do watch out for things like group relief and make sure that's planned uh, with, with on the tax side um, for for future purposes as well. Um, and other potential corporation tax issues can arise when you are involved with a, a property development and you use a, say, a design and build company and you transfer that property to the subsidiary. Now, you may have held that as a fixed asset, one of your investments or one of your operating properties, let's say, and then that could be what we call an appropriation to stock or can go the other way as well. Now, that can give rise to a taxable chargeable gain on that appropriation to and from stock. Again, there needs to be planning to ensure that um, where it's possible with things like valuations, et cetera, that um, you minimize that, um, that, that get inadvertent uh, taxable gain. Um, so again, just make sure you've got ducks in a row when you do actually transfer to a trading subsidiary, um, which I'll talk about more on the next slide. So, the the uh, the training subsidiary um, is is an area I said we, we, we can we can use for planning for direct tax as well as for VAT and make sure that you don't have corporation tax leakage, which is so important. 
um, but again, try and align your accounting and tax position. Now, um, another area where we often see um, traps within the not-for-profit as well as the you know, housing association sector is where you do just sell a property and say, well, that's a capital gain, it's all right, I'm selling that on. But often we see in the in the, the property world that there's not always just a fixed consideration that's paid by developer for your property. If it has development opportunity, they will often want to give you a slice of the action. And even though that slice of the action might still be a gain, it gets caught within some anti-avoidance legislation here, section 755, and that charges those gains to a, an effective income tax charge under these transactions and land. So watch that, watch overages, that slice of the action. They may not be exempt. Sometimes they can be drafted to be exempt if they're not geared around the actual profit of the developer. So planning, and drafting a contract is very important to get your tax advisors involved at an early stage, even if you think you're just selling property on and you've got an exempt gain. And I think if we move on, I think that's my my final word before we move to uh, Q&A and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Luke. I think um, given the time, what we'll do for the Q&A is cover any questions uh, via email. Uh, after the event. So which really just leaves me to uh, wrap up just to say that a reminder that the slides and the recording will be uh, sent round after the uh, event so you'll receive those and also just to mention that we'll be up at the NHF Finance Conference in Liverpool on the 15th and 16th of March. We've got to stand there so please do come and say hello if you're attending that that conference. Um, but as I say, I'll draw it to a close now. So finally, just to say thank you for everyone for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.